So good morning. I'm very happy to start this uh, workshop with the first session on cognitive bias or biases, I should say. So it's about the shortcuts we have in our mind that impact our decisions and can have terrible consequences on how we treat uh, men and women. So to tell how it works, uh, we have uh, three outstanding speakers and I would like to really thank them for being uh, with us today. So we have uh, Albert Mukeber, uh, Wim Dennis, and Suzanne Quadflig. Sorry if I don't say it right. Um, so as uh, Christian said, uh, each of them will give a 20 minute talk and we will take all the questions at the end of the talks during the round table. So uh, I know it can be frustrating for persons in the auditorium, but please keep in mind your questions and ask them at the end of the talks. And for Zoom uh, participants, please write them in the, in the chat. And we are lucky to have a Zoom moderator. Uh, for our session, it will be Eliana Luzada. And she will come here and uh, collect all your Zoom questions and will ask them to the speakers during the roundtable. So let's start uh, with the first speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Albert Mukeber. So Albert uh, has a PhD in neuroscience uh, and he is a clinician a psychologist in Paris. Um, he is also a co-founder of the Chiasma Association, which aim is to translate finding findings from uh, cognitive science research into techniques that uh, people can practice to, um, to use in their life, in their everyday life, uh, improve their critical thinking. So Albert is uh, very interested in cognitive biases and how a better understanding of these biases can improve the society, for instance, fighting uh, climate change, fake news, and today, uh, gender inequity. So thank you very much, uh, Albert, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. <coughs> and hello, everyone. I have the hard task of starting the presentation. It's going to go well. Uh, and my presentation is going to be a bit about an introduction to cognitive biases, just so that we are all on the same page during uh, the colloquium today. And we go, I'm going to be asking a very simple question which is the following, why don't we all see the same world? When we think about it, we're supposed to be sharing an objective, stable reality, but we don't have the same opinions about it. You're going to see the same slides, you're going to hear the same words, but you're not going to have the same opinion. Why don't we all think the same thing? Why can't we all see reality the way it is? Uh, obviously, there are many answers for this. We don't have the same temperament, we don't live the same lives, we don't have the same personalities. But we think that there's another reason which relates to our information processing that can give us an insight on this topic. And there are three main reasons in our functioning that we think would lead to not having the same thing, even if we could, in a certain thought experiment, um, have the same person. Like if you have two people in the same situation, we think they won't think the same thing for three very basic reasons that I'm going to present. The first one is that we have a very partial perception even if we were sharing the same reality, if we are sharing the same room, we don't have the resources to perceive everything going on. If I look here, I don't see what's happening there. If I look here, I don't see what's happening behind me. The second thing is that we have limited attention and resources. Even if we're looking in the same direction, we don't remember everything. We have limited cognitive capacities, and these are made worse by the fact that the world is complex. If the world was very simple, maybe our cognitive apparatus would be easier to help us get to common consensus. And this leads us to a certain physical truth, that is we are most of the time dealing with incomplete information. We, have, we live in a world of uncertainty and our brain seems to be doing some stuff to hide this from us. When I live during my daily life, I don't have the feeling that I am living in uncertainty. I feel like the world is stable and that I can see most of the things around me. When I form my opinions, I'm quite 
convinced about them, even if most of the time I'm forming them based on very parcellary information. To show you, just to have a bit of fun this morning, to show you a bit how much our attention is limited, I'm going to show you a mini experiment. On the next slide there are two images, and between these two images we have put the equivalent of a blink. And between these two images only one thing is changing. And the goal of the experiment is very easy, when you find what is changing, it's just to raise your hand so that you let the other people try to find it. And just so that you know, if there wasn't the blink, you would see it immediately. Just this short cut of our attention is enough to take us a few seconds. Everyone will find it, it's just going to take a few seconds. And once you find it, you can't unsee it. And then you're wondering, why aren't, why aren't other people seeing it? It's going to start getting faster and faster. And the problem is, the more people raise their hand, the people that haven't seen it would find certain pressure and then have less chance of finding it because pressure mobilizes our attention and resources, and then the little that we have is gone. To, to <laughs> and people, some people would raise their hand just by peer pressure. They haven't found it, but they don't want to be like, I'm not the one that finds it. Um, to relieve the frustration of everyone, it's the uh, bar on the background. It's going up and down. So it's not like, it's not a small detail. Uh, so for those that didn't succeed, I'm going to give you an easier task. Can you find the apple on this slide? <laughs> now everyone feels good, and now I'm going to make everyone feel bad again. Can you find where's Waldo? And then it's more complicated, whereas these two tasks are actually the same. You're trying to, it's like an object recognition task. The only difference is that this is more complex, and our world looks more like this, and we don't have the resources to be able to store in memory every face we've checked until we find Waldo. I hope everyone knows what Waldo looks like. So if we have these limited resources, and if we can't really know that we're dealing with incomplete information most of the time. This begs the question, which I try to work on, uh, which is how do we acquire knowledge? How can I know what I know if I'm constantly working with uncertainty? How can I evaluate the quality of my opinions? And for the longest of times, we didn't really have a method to acquire knowledge. We used to do intuitive knowledge acquisitions. If something seems to be coherent, we'd accept it. For example, for almost 2,000 years in medicine, if someone would be sick, our first line of defense was blood bloodletting. If you're sick, you go to uh, see a doctor in the 1500s, and there's high chance that they would just cut you up, drop a bit of blood, wait a few days, and see how it goes. And the intuitive reasoning there was, if someone has some sort of disease, the best way to fix it is to bring it out. So we would bloodlet, wait a few days. Now let's say I have the flu, after a few days I'm gonna tell myself I'm gonna get better, and society would tell itself bloodletting works. And if I have something a bit worse, I get bloodletted, after a few days I'm not better, what, would, what do you think would we do? Does anyone know? Yeah, we'd do it again. We'd say, maybe the disease is not in his left arm, maybe it's in his right arm. So we would bloodlet your right arm. If you're not feeling better, we'd do the leg and then the other leg. And if in the unfortunate event that you die, we'd go, we can't save everyone. Basically, we seem to be using whatever information we have. Obviously, the incomplete information in this, in this example is that we didn't know that viruses exist, microbes, bacteria, the whole immune system. And we would just like, use whatever is available as information. And with this, we can do a lot of funny stuff. There's a researcher called Tyler Vigen. I'm sure you, everyone is familiar with these. The black, uh, on this graph, the, the black uh, thing is the movies in which Nicolas Cage has appeared. The, right, the red one is the number of people who drowned falling in a pool. And the correlation is 66%. Obviously, everyone is familiar with correlation not being causation. But if we don't ask ourselves, how do things work, we would be able to defend the point of view that we should tell Nicolas Cage to do less movies so that we f save people from drowning. And obviously in this example things are very clear, but sometimes it's a bit less clear. For example, if you take this, this is actually a, a real case scenario. In the 50s there was a mini polio pandemic in the United States and the polio cases were correlating in a very mysterious way with ice cream sales. And back then they did a recommendation for people to stop eating ice cream. They did a recall of the ice cream thinking that they were like contaminated with polio. And then when they tested the ice creams, the ice cream was totally normal. What was happening is what we call confounding variables. There was an incomplete information. In this case, it was temperature. 
it's seasonality when it's hotter we eat more ice cream when it's hotter polio is spread faster and incomplete information our brain creates links with whatever information is available thinking that ice cream is causing polio i forgot to change the word ice cream to english and this gets us to a certain constructivistic uh, idea that the map is not the territory. We're constantly trying to create representations of the real world. These are the maps that we have towards the territory, which is the real world, that we don't have access to because we get access through our senses. And as we've seen, our senses are not perfect. In science, we call our maps theoretical models that we have to explicit, that we have to peer review, that we have to publish in articles. But we all have a set of rules in our mind that are implicit that our brain is constantly creating about everything we've encountered in our lives. Like right now, your brain is creating maps about what I'm saying. My brain is creating maps about you, depending on how you're sitting, if you're looking at me, if you're not looking at me. And these maps are what make me who I am. And these maps are always incomplete because of the what we've seen. So the question becomes, how does our brain create these maps? What are the rules, what are the, the, the mechanisms that our brain is using to create these rules that make up who I am? And what eventual biases can impact these? And these maps are usually created in, in three, I also forgot to translate this, uh, are in, in four steps. It's a very simplistic uh, um, figure. We have to perceive the world, we have to interpret it, we have to communicate it because we are social animals, and all this bathes in a certain context. So we're going to try to check on our perception and our interpretation today because we don't have a lot of time. And to make the jump from our perception to our reasoning so that we finally get to our cognitive biases, I'm going to use another optical illusion, which is this one. I don't know if you've seen it, but my question to you is very simple. Can the people that see this dancer turning clockwise raise their hand? People seeing it clockwise, okay, counterclockwise, sorry. So we have a first problem, is that we're looking at the same thing and we're not seeing the same thing, which is quite problematic if you want to be in agreement on stuff. So I'm going to give you a small nudge and do this. And now if you look on the right and then in the middle, the dancer in the middle will start turning counterclockwise for everyone. Independently of what you were seeing, just have to, it's a perceptive task, there's no reasoning going on yet. If I do this, if you look on the left and then in the center, the dancer in the center will start to turn clockwise. And if I, to prove that I'm not cheating, if you look on the right and then in the middle, the dancer in the middle, turn away, one in the middle and the left. And what's happening here, the theoretical model behind this, I don't know if I have a counter, I have a pointer, is that this is what we call a bistable illusion, an ambiguous bistable illusion. This is lacking information, it's like what we've shown in our introduction. The information that's lacking is depth perception. We have a 3D movement and we don't have visual cues that give us any depth. We don't know if the leg is going in the front or in the back. On the left and on the right, we have the stabilized version of the bistable illusion. We've added information, visual information. You can see the blue going back and in the front and it gives information that this is the right leg and the movement is clockwise. And here we have the opposite. And what happens is quite mechanistic. It's very simple, but it's going to be very important to understand our biases, is that if you look here for a few milliseconds or a few seconds, you're going to form a prior, in this case, a visual prior. And you're going to carry your prior to stabilize the ambiguity, the lack of information based on your prior. If you look here, we're going to form another prior, and you're going to stabilize the same way. If this is what we call a bistable ambiguous illusion, reality is what we could call a multistable ambiguous illusion. Reality is by definition lacking information because of what we've seen. And there are philosophers that think that there are as many ways to stabilize reality as there are individuals. That this is basically what we're describing when you're describing the personality of someone. For example, if I talk if I say that someone is an optimist, being an optimist means that it's someone that reduces the ambiguity of the future on a positive note and someone being a pessimist, it's someone that adds, based on their priors, information on the future on a negative note. Our brain is constantly filling gaps with our priors. Since we have a lack of information, we are filling these gaps with the priors that we have. And we can say that we don't see the world as it is, but rather as we are, who we are being my culture, the society I'm born in, my temperament, my education, etc. This doesn't mean that the world is not important. I'm not at all defending a relativistic view. There's a certain function about how this works. 
the more a situation is uncertain, the more we can interpret it the way we want, and the less a situation is uncertain, the less we can interpret it the way we want. Like if I imagine now, I interpret the ambiguity that you have uh, as thinking it's going well, and then someone tells me your talk was shit, I have to accept reality. For example, in my PhD studies, I worked on uh, social phobia. I, sorry, I said shit, I didn't mean it. Uh, <laughs> In my PhD studies, I worked on social phobia, and in our social cognition, we have three order of thoughts. Our first order of thoughts is what do we think about ourselves? Our second order is what we think about others. And our third order is what do we think that other thinks about us? And if in social phobia, our third order thoughts are always thoughts that people are judging me negatively. I reduce the ambiguity of your stare, the way you're looking at me, thinking that I can see in their eyes that they think that what I'm saying is not interesting. My prior being social phobia means I'm reducing the ambiguity of your social cognition that you're judging me negatively. But imagine I'm not social phobic, I'm the most arrogant person in the room, then I can look at you and you're still looking at me the same way and I can say I see in their eyes that they're amazed by my intelligence. And between these two extremes where I think you think that I'm not good or you think that I'm the smartest person in the room, you didn't change. What changed are my priors. My priors are conditioning the way I'm interpreting reality. Our brain is constantly trying to predict what's happening in a storytelling uh, manner. Uh, Lionel Nakash works in the ECM, published a, a, a book recently called Le Cinéma Intérieur, about how we have like sort of cinema in our mind that creates these narrations. And to use, to create these predictions, we use something called heuristics. Heuristics are approximative solutions for problems that work relatively well. It's like rule of thumb uh, situation. I use my priors to try to predict for efficiency reasons, and they work really relatively well, usually. For example, if you want an, an example of what we're trying to do, so heuristics are mostly automatic thoughts. Um, for example, in social phobia, I look at you and then you're looking at me and my brain imagines that you're judging me negatively. It's an automatic thought. I, I don't my patients don't sit and think what is they think what are they thinking are they thinking i'm good it just comes automatically and it's it's a very good mechanism and way of functioning because it make it gives us efficiency for example if you look at this troop task i'm sure you all know troop um, if you try to read the words it's quite easy we read in an automatic way because we've been reading for a long time so like yellow brown green black orange blue but you can try to do something else. Instead of reading the words, you can try to read the color of the font. And then you need some effort. You need to resist your heuristic to activate something different, something else. And we'll be talking about this something else a bit later. We have to learn how to resist sometimes our automatic thoughts and emotions because sometimes our heuristics make errors. And when our heuristics, when these approximations based on our priors are non-optimal, this is what we call cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are when we're lacking information for many reasons, can be because of our attention, because of our perception, because of our memory, because of extremely strong priors, because of our learning, and our heuristics are in a certain context not working really well. And we've already identified a lot of biases. They're mostly predictable. Um, stereotyping, social norms, for example, optimism. I've talked about optimism. So an optimistic person is someone that reduces the ambiguity of the future in a positive way. And it's usually a desirable trait. But if you take an optimist and put him, for example, in a casino, you get into an optimism bias. So biases, because they lose, and then they would say, I'm going to win, and then they lose again, I'm going to win. And this reduction of ambiguity of the future becomes negative. So biases are mostly contextual. It's like a heuristic in a certain situation can be very good, and when it's another situation, it, be it can become less good or bad. And today, what we're mostly interested in are biases related to gender. So I'm going to be talking about stereotyping bias. I'm going to explain this whole notion of context and how sometimes it can be good or bad. Before that, I'm just going to show you an example of a very simple bias called uh, uh, priming bias, so I'm sure you all know this brand, Colgate, it's a toothpaste brand, and they put up an ad recently, a few years ago, not recently, it has a mistake, can anyone see it? What is it? Yeah, there's something on the tooth, and this is what uh, priming uh, is, because I said Colgate, you see the tooth, but the real question is, whose hand is this? Which is... 
touches the actual tooth. So your automatic perception is because of Colgate, you look at the tooth, and what we would want to do to correct our biases, we call this a metacognition. We want to think, disengage, and then engage somewhere else. Another bias that's quite easy is framing. For example, this experiment that was done in a movie theater, uh, we put on sale a small pop popcorn for three euros and another one for seven, and we noticed that most of our sales are at the three euros. And when we ask people, why are you buying the three euro popcorn? They're like, this is a scam. We're never going to pay seven euros for a popcorn. And then the next week, we don't touch the size nor the price, don't touch the size nor the price. We just add a new popcorn. And now suddenly the framing of the information changes. This becomes the small popcorn, medium popcorn, large popcorn, and our sales move from here to here. And then we ask people, why are you buying this popcorn? And they're like, the small popcorn is for losers. It's going to be over before the, 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 the trailers end. 6.50, I'm going to pay 50 cents more and then get to the big popcorn. So these are very simple biases. If we get to stereotyping, it's a bit similar, but you're going to take a bit more time. So why do we stereotype? And in what cases is stereotyping actually good? Stereotyping is basically creating categories about things based on common uh, factors. And the problem is that reality is what we call dimensional. We call this the dimensional problem. Uh, a dimensionality is something that is a certain continuum. We can take an, a metaphor, which is the light spectrum. The light spectrum is actually a continuum. And there is no clear delimitation between when the red becomes orange, when the orange becomes yellow, when the yellow becomes green, etc. But if we had to speak together about colors and always be exact, like I have to tell you the value of the wavelength, like I'm going to tell someone, oh, I like your 432 uh, nano wave uh, shirt, it would be very complicated. We, it's not operationable. We can't really talk about the world if we have to be super precise. So we stereotype, we create categories. The, 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 for the dimensional problem, we propose a categorical solution, and we're going to just have colors, red, green, violet, blue, orange, and gray. This makes us lose in complexity, but it makes us win in manageability. Another type of stereotyping, imagine I'm a hunter-gatherer, I'm walking in the forest, and I see a red mushroom, I eat it, and it gives me a tummy ache. It would be a quite good heuristic to say that from this point on, I'm just going to avoid red mushrooms. I'm, going to, I'm not going to tell myself I shouldn't discriminate against red mushrooms. And I should try each one because I shouldn't essentialize them. It's going to be quite useful. The problem is that when we use these stereotyping biases, these stereotyping heuristics to humans, then it becomes a bias and it becomes discrimination. If I meet someone that has black hair and we don't get along and then I tell myself I'm going to avoid everyone that has black hair from this day on, this becomes problematic. And the problem is that we do this a lot in social cognition. We usually create categories, then we identify with one of these categories and then we compare. And when we compare, it's not always going really well. So I'm going to categorize based on gender. I can categorize based on ethnicity. I can categorize based on skin color, based on age, based on many, many things. And the problem is I'm going to essentialize the person to this category. I'm going to identify with this category or with another one and then compare. And when I compare, I'm just going to be comparing at the category that I've created. And I won't be comparing about all the other things because I have incomplete information that can make a person uh, and the relationship much richer. I'm going to assign a person to a certain stereotype that I've created in my mind, and most of these are obviously unconscious, and then change the way I behave with them. Uh, the way we categorize can be more or less gross, and in gender biases, it's one of the grossest category we can have. We're going to assign the, the functioning of a person based on their gender, and it's also the same for race and all these other things. So what I've shown today is just the basics about our heuristics, how they work. And when we were doing this troop task, I told you it seems that we have different ways to think about the world. We don't have to always function in a heuristical model. We seem to have the capacity to have a bit of say and if you want to accept or automatic thoughts. For example, um, I did the PhD in neuroscience. I'm also a clinical psychologist. And when I do therapy, most of the therapy, like a big part of therapy is trying to resist these automatic thoughts, these heuristics, and then do something more declarative, what we call our metacognition. And this metacognition comes from a theoretical model called dual system processing that was developed by a researcher called Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. It seems that we have two systems. 
a fast system that is unconscious automatic for everyday decisions but that is error prone and the second system that is slow conscious effortful for more complex decisions and to introduce this dual processing systems i'm going to leave you with the next speaker Wim, that will be talking about all this thank you very much Emmanuel.